Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier, and thank you for stopping by. Let me start with thanking Moody's uh, uh, for the invitation to participate in the Moody's East Africa Summit. And, uh, it was a really very interesting uh, session uh, yesterday at the Kapinski, and I'll, I'll be showing some data points and comments. Uh, that came from from, from that uh, presentation by Moody's. The main guest was Dr. Patrick Jirogi of the Central Bank, who was quite amusing, to be honest, the most amusing I'd heard him, um, but also very bullish about GDP. He predicted 6.3% GDP full year uh, 2018. Macro thoughts, commentary for markets 2018 mid-year looks more like a Tipping point, that's Jamie at Reuters. Emerging markets are under heavy and mounting pressure. Credit markets are crumbling. The US bond yield curve is barely 30 basis points from inverting, which may portend a recession. Tech and bank stocks, which led Wall Street's rally earlier this year, are also wobbling. Add to that a sharp slide in the Chinese currency and rise in global trade war fears. And it's not hard to see why some investors might want to throw in the towel completely. Chinese and Brazilian stocks are in bear markets. India's rupee is at a record low. And according to the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch Global Equity Funds posted their second biggest ever weekly outflow last week, $30 billion. And then saying uh, some strategists of BAML note the parallels between now and 1998, which I can recall as if it were yesterday. My biggest client was LTCM at that time. When the Asian crisis and LTCM crash plunged world markets into turmoil, Fed tightening, US decoupling, and dollar strength flattening yield curves and emerging market weakness. Between July 1997 and October 1998, emerging market equities fell 59% in dollar terms. And between July and October 1998, developed markets capitulated. The S&P fell 22%, the NASDAQ 33%, US bank stocks 43%. There's no suggestion declines and swings of this magnitude are imminent or even likely, concludes uh, Jamie. 14th of May, I was sort of thinking exactly what Jamie said much more succinctly and, and pithily than I did. I was saying on the 14th of May, this is all the ingredients for baking a good old-fashioned crisis. The Chinese yuan and Shanghai composite in free fall on eve of US tariff hike. That's from Holger. Asia in bad shape a day before the deadline on these trade tariffs. David Inglis. Stocks down for ninth time in 10 days. Philippine gets clobbered. Inflation shoots up further. Eight shares sink deeper into bear markets. Sovereigns and dollar bid. Copper hammered in Shanghai, he said. Dr. Jirogi of the Central Bank uh, forecast a 6.3% full year 2018 GDP expansion at this Moody's conference I attended. A couple of interesting points came out. Purchases of watches within 24 hours of getting a loan is very predictive of default risk. And 80% of all loans by number are now on mobile platforms here in Kenya shows you uh, the speed and ubiquity of the mobile economy. Home thoughts, I was disappointed that I didn't capture the owl head on until it occurred to me that this shot of it disappearing into the gloom might capture a far more atmospheric impression indeed it did. I had seen the royal lion before sunrise below a waning moon crossing the grey plain on his way home from the kill, drawing a wake in the silvery grass, his face still red up to the ears. Isaac Denison. 
who also wrote this, how beautiful were the evenings of the Maasai Reserve when after sunset we arrived at the river or the waterhole where we were to outspan traveling in a long file. The plains with the thorn trees on them were already quite dark, but the air was filled with clarity. And over our heads to the west, a single star, which was to grow big and radiant in the course of the night, is now just visible, like a silver point in the sky of citrine topaz. The air was cold to the lungs, the long grass dripping wet, and the herbs on it gave out their spiced, astringent scent. In a little while, on all sides, the kikada would begin to sing. The grass was me, and the air, the distant invisible mountains were me, the tired oxen were me. I breathed with the slight night wind in the thorn trees. She writes very beautifully about uh, Africa. Political reflections, US to keep Persian Gulf waterway open despite Iran threats. The US military is reiterating a promise to keep Persian Gulf waterways open to oil tankers as Iran renewed threats to close off the region. Captain Bill Urban, the spokesman for the US military's Central Command, told the Associated Press on Wednesday that American sailors and its regional allies stand ready to ensure the freedom of navigation and the free flow of commerce wherever international law allows. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani on Tuesday suggested Iran could halt regional exports if it stopped from exporting oil after America pulled out of the nuclear deal with world powers. Iranian General Qasem Soleimani reportedly sent a letter to Rouhani applauding his stance. To put things in perspective, considering potential disruption, the last major crisis of global economic consequence took place nearly three decades ago since the rare age. Um, in August 1990, when Iraq's invasion of Kuwait took 4.3 million barrels per day off oil, off the market, about 6.5% of world supply, that stoppage caused world oil prices to double from $20 to $40 per barrel. But a blo blockade of the Straits of Hormuz would cut off nearly four times as much oil as the Kuwait crisis did, disrupting a share of the oil market three times greater. So, you've got to keep an eye on that. The China-US power struggle is just beginning, says Bloomberg. On a deeper level, the standoff reflects an escalating economic and military rivalry between a status quo power and one of the most remarkable growth miracles in history, says Bloomberg. It's a clash between divergent systems, one state directed, the other market driven, with markedly divergent worldviews and national aspirations. That strategic tension seems likely to intensify, regardless of how the current brinkmanship over tariffs plays out. Battle for global influence. In the US, a bipartisan consensus has begun to emerge that now is the time to stand up to China, even if many oppose President Trump's tactics. With roughly a $13 trillion economy and expanding wealth, China is now going head-to-head -head with the US in advanced manufacturing and digital technologies. Xi is playing a long game, pursuing what he calls the Chinese dream, or the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. This is a country on what it views as a historic mission to become a 21st century economic power, and the contest is just beginning. Interesting that a leaked Chinese propaganda guidance obtained by CDT provides some very unique insights about PRC preferences, strategy, and public opinion management for the US-China trade war. Guidance suggests the PRC wants to frame the trade war to its people as US-led containment, the pivot to Asia. The trade conflict is really a war against China's rise to see who has the greatest stamina. This is this is absolutely no time for irresolution or reticence, 
The PRC fears this won't end soon. All media should prepare well for a protracted conflict. Don't follow the American side's fluctuating declarations. The PRC knows made in China 2025 is a major problem. Rather than change end it, they think it is better to hide it. To re-emphasize, do not make further use of made in China 2025 or there will be consequences. Indeed, the phrase has largely stopped showing up in Xinhua. They don't want a war of words with Trump, perhaps because they fear he's quite good at them. Don't attack Trump's vulgarity. Don't make this a war of insults. Unsurprisingly, their strategy is to pit U.S. interests against each other. We should strike accurately and carefully splitting apart different domestic groups in the U.S. They're going after the farm economy. There is an awareness that public opinion could become more inflamed on this issue. We should hold public opinion at a good level without escalating. 28th of August last year, my piece was called China Rising. China vows, however, it will never fire the first shot ahead of the US in a trade war. So keen not to see it escalate. Happy birthday, America, tweeted President Trump. And some very nice photographs. Here are two of them. And then I like this. Happy Independence Day, um, uh, America. Nobody is more power drunk than a civil servant in charge of some form of registration. I don't resist that. From the highest office to the highest court, Malaysia gripped by Najib's downfall. Ecuador has requested via Interpol the detention of the ex-president Rafael Correa, who is currently in Belgium. 60% of the Nigerian population is under 25. That's 60% of the population which, like me, did not witness colonization. We are the new generations of Emmanuel Macron. Look, he's got to upend France Afrique, and there's been a lot of criticism saying, you know, it's all talk. But from my perspective, at least, there is some talk here. And the point he's making is that, you know, of course, Africa's not a country, it's non linear. However, what is clear is that the demographic surge, in that demographic surge, is the overwhelming nature of the numbers of the born free generation, which whom he was appealing to. Africa has the youngest popul global population. Have a look at this from Moody's. Let's move on to the international markets. Have a look at this uh, Netflix debt and share price uh, as posted by Olga. This is the yield on Germany's two-year bond, still deep in negative territory. Let's move on to the currency markets. Euro dollar having a bit of a run higher, last trading at 117.06. Dollar index slipping 94.37. Japanese yen 110.58. Swiss franc 0.9917. The pound uh, 132.45. Australia dollar 0.7384. India rupee 68.825, South Korean 111.1918, Brazilian real 391.25, Egyptian pound 1789.17, South African rand 13.7126. This is a three month chart of the dollar index. And I think, you know, we've got a bit of rotation with a downside tilt, but we're still in a bull trend. Euro dollar. That 115.10, 115 area proved a double bottom. We're now rallying quite violently today, 117.06. Glencore is to start a share buyback program of up to a billion dollars. Of course, yeah, they're subject to the Department of State uh, subpoena. Um, and, I, and as I tweeted, Glencore and their Euro, uh, uh, Dan Gertler Gambit, was in fact too damn cute, don't you think? Internet entrepreneur Kim.com loses bid to stop extradition to the US and will take the battle to New Zealand Supreme Court. Uh, I went back to a tweet at the end of 2016. More I'm not done, I've just begun, he tweeted. Commodity markets, gold is at 1256. Of course, it dipped as low as 1236, I think, uh, a couple of days ago. Crude oil, this is interesting, let's take a look at that, is $72.46. Um, uh, I think uh, the market is concerned that uh, Trump is going to release some oil from the Special Reserve um, and therefore I'm trading it a little bit defensive. But if the Straits of Hormuz are blocked by the Iranians, it's going to jump like anything. 
the emerging markets, if someone tells you the earnings outlook across the emerging markets is sound and valuations are cheap, just show them the chart below. That's David Inglis. Look at the portfolio flows and the dip in the recent term into emerging markets in Africa. Again, that's from Moody's. Turkey's 10-year bond yield has almost doubled during the last couple of years, yet with headline inflation at 15.4%, the real yield is negative, J.S. Blockland. I like this photograph, my Dar es Salaam moment, carrier coup. There's also a carrier core here in uh, Nairobi as well. Um, that's Explore with Nordi. China is now Africa's largest trading partner with trade totaling $114 billion in 2016. That accounted for around 14% of the continent's total exports as New African magazine. Um, but they are asking as China shifts to consumption-led growth, Africa's oil and ferrous metal exporters are set to suffer. But tourism and investment will benefit, according to Moody's again in this report that New African is quoting. This is the FUNA public pool back in 1969. Really looks it's a lyrical photograph. Zimbabwean opposition threatens to pull out of election in the FT. Nelson Chamisa, Mr. Manangagwa's biggest challenge in the July 30 vote, demanded a halt to printing the ballot papers on Wednesday warning that we will not have an election without a ballot paper that has been agreed upon. This is a political crisis, he said. We will not repeat the mistakes of 2013, referring to the last election in which rigging was rife. Zimbabwe's army says it will uphold the constitution during the election, but it's not said whether it would accept an opposition party in power. Instead of Zanu PF, the former liberation movement, an army spokesperson denied on Wednesday that its soldiers had been sent to rural areas to intimidate voters into backing Zanu PF. According to polling released last month by Afrobarometer, 42% of Zimbabweans plan to vote for Mr. Manangagwa in Zanu PF, against 31% for Mr. Chamisa in the MDC implying the presidential vote may go to a runoff in September. The intentions of over a quarter of the voters remain unknown. Um, and then the AP is also asking, you know, after Mugabe, how free and fair will Zimbabwe's vote be? Um, but, you know, uh, saying we're sure Zimbabwe's will not be railroaded into a sham election. Zimbabweans don't need to worry about the military's advice, President Constantine Chiwengwa, who was military commander in November with soldiers and tanks deployed in Harare. The military intervened to back a ruling party faction loyal to Manangagwa, who had been fired as Mugabe's deputy in a feud with a group associated with Mugabe's politically ambitious wife, Grace. There will not be a recurrence, let me assure you, Chiwengwa said last week. We had created a situation which was bad for ourselves, and that will not happen again. 20th of November last year, I wrote a piece in Zimbabwe, the genie's out of the bottle, and I think you know any intervention of that type, um, where you know you blatantly the opposition of one, is just not going to fly. South African oil shares down 3.2 percent year to date. Dollar versus rand 13.7126, but we're seeing a little bit of a rebound. At the moment, let's see how long that lasts. World Bank backs Egypt to become regional oil and gas trading hub. Last month, Egypt issued what is likely to be its last LNG import tender and could begin exports early in 2019, and Moller told Bloomberg. The June tender was for Egypt's third quarter gas needs, and it might not need to import LNG for the fourth quarter and onwards. Um, local production should cover our needs. Egyptian pound is at 17.8917. France's President Macron paid homage at Nigeria's shrine. He said, I can't tell you everything that happened when I used to come to the shrine because what happens at the shrine stays at the shrine. Procter and Gamble are to shut down a $300 million Nigerian production plant one year after launch. Then I saw this tweet about Nigeria refused to sign the African 
free trade agreement because you're protecting local industry, but Procter & Gamble just closed shop on $300 million after only a year, yet you expect the world to take you serious? Question mark. Nigeria is down 1.95% this year. Ghana stock exchange is up 10.3% this year. June sees sustained improvement in private sector business conditions in Kenya. Headline PMI softens slightly from May, but remains solid at 55. Dr. Jarogi, the headroom on national debt is narrowing, limited headroom. We cannot continue with the same model. I couldn't agree more. This is a def affordability uh, infographic from Moody's. You can see what Dr. Jarogi is alluding to. Um, and this is what I was alluding to in January when I said what is clear now is that the government of Kenya simply does not have the resource envelope to pursue all its priority projects on its own balance sheet. Mobile phones and financial inclusion, this is, uh, shows how Kenya is a serious outlier in this regard. Diaspora rep remittances surged to 112.21 billion shillings in the January to May period from 73.92 billion in the same period in 2017. And this confirms what I was saying. Tax consultants at audit firm PKF last month reported a surge in clients seeking to file and return wealth stashed in foreign countries to enjoy the tax part. Nairobi All Share firmed yesterday and got back into positive territory for the year, just 0.1%, still 12.82% below its record high set on April 5. NSC 20 is down 11.74% this year. Dr. Jarogi said we liked the Nairobi Mombasa road model. This is the Bechtel road model. When I grew up, the land was for the community. The excellent article in Africa arguments about oil in Turkana. On a Sunday afternoon in Lodwa, the capital of Turkana, a crowd gathers to watch a hoopla game at a muddy crossroads. The spectators, many wearing the blankets and beads of pastoralists, Observe as hopefuls try to win a bottle of Fanta, or even better, the big prize, 50 US cents. Turkana, located in the northwest of the country, is the largest and poorest of Kenya's 47 counties. Since 2013, it has received $100 million per year from the National Exchequer. According to a funding formula designed to help marginalized areas catch up, but it remains extremely impoverished. 79% of its nearly 1 million people are below the national poverty line. And now saying, you know, Tallo has turned up, uh, opened the oil fields. Many are frustrated. This has not led to more jobs and benefits for those who lived on the land for generations. Members of the herding community around the village of Nakukulas have barricaded roads in protest. Many people working with Tala are from Nairobi, but they've only given jobs to one or two locals. When I grew up, the land was for the community. That is what I knew. God gave us the oil, like the land. Now we hear the government say it belongs to them. Tallo tried to earn goodwill by offering $70,000 for each well it drills to committees of residents, and then saying they're still demanding that they build a hospital, drill for water. And then Dennis Okore, as a spokesman for Tallo, says, people look at us as if we are the government. If someone is bitten by a snake, look for Tallo. Need a road, go to Tallo. The appetite for benefits and employment has increased hugely, he said. Um, and uh, it really is a very interesting article, um, saying optimistic that things can be resolved, but many locals whose way of life may be at risk are not so sure. In the face of elite interests and and oil majors. Takana's pastoralists may struggle to push back, as Nakwan Echwa's weak threat reveals. If the worst comes to the worst, he says, we can raise up the spirits that are in our soil and make that oil not come out. Tello reported, according to Reuters, that Kenyan protesters are blocking their oil trucks. Confirmed that there have been interruptions to the trucking of crude oil in Turkana County. Tallow has provisionally reduced the number of personnel in the field while operations have paused. 
An excellent article in the Daily Beast, the Kenyan beach town Melindi is a tropical paradise with a mafia problem. If it weren't for the oppressive humidity and the slight scent of French penny, you might think you were in Italy. In the corner of a restaurant, skinny woman with brassy blonde hair, diamante earrings and skin the colour of old leather pushes the remains of her penne, al pomodori, across, around on the plate before finally giving up and signalling to the Kenyan waiter, un espresso per favore. A TV booms in the corner, a news anchor relaying Italy's latest political woes. A heavyset man in his late 60s, tufts of greying hair sticking out from under his collar sighs and shakes his head before taking a long, deep drag on his cigarette. His companion, a Kenyan girl in her 20s, keeps her eyes firmly on the screen of her phone, not bothering to hide the look of tedium from her face. It's low season in Lindy, a small town on the Kenyan coast where the Galana River spills its muddy waters into the Indian Ocean. An important port city since at least the 13th century. Melindi has been settled over centuries by Arab traders, the Portuguese, uh, the British, and most recently by thousands of Italians. Place of stunning natural beauty where sinewy palm trees line pearly white beaches and tufts of cerise bougainvilleas creep up the crumbling walls that run along the coastal road. Perhaps this is why Italians started coming here in the 1970s. The very first Italians, though, came in the name of science. In 1963, a team lead by, led by a young space engineer called Luigi Broglio began the construction of a satellite launch pad some 30 kilometers north of Melindi as part of a partnership between NASA's CRA. By the 1980s, Italians were flocking to Melindi, buying up all the prime beachfront and real estate. During the construction wave of the 1990s, they built dozens of hotels and villaggi, the quintessentially Italian-style resorts, where tourists can speak Italian, eat Italian, and dance to Italian music. Before the Eurozone crisis, the number of Italians living in Melindi was close to the 4,000 mark, while 30,000 more would come and go throughout the year. They opened restaurants, gelaterie, supermarkets, selling mozzarella and homemade pasta, started tour companies and import businesses. In 2007, Formula One's Playboy, par excellence, Flavio Priatori, who in the 1980s was convicted for fraud and later in 2008 was forced off the F1 team after a race-fixing scandal, announced he would build the Billionaires Club. Melindy's most luxurious resort. If it were not for the Italians, we would have nothing, Giovanni told me over a bottle of Menazzi, a lo local alcoholic drink of fermented palm tree sap. But at the Menazzi dead, his opinion was not a popular one. They don't respect us, they come here and think they're better, they control the tourism industry and tell other Italians not to trust the locals. The Kenyan coastal resort town of Melindi is schizophrenic. Hundreds of Italians dominate the town's economic lifeline, a tourism industry that caters to tens of thousands of European sun seekers annually. Just a year earlier, a 73-year-old Italian man and his Venezuelan wife were arrested after 700 kilos of narcotics were seized from a speedboat stored on their land. Melindi has a reputation as a shady place. Talking about a local journalist, Paul Gitao, who said that the city was firm in the grip of the Italian Mafia. Eric Mutau, the chairman of the LSK, is quoted as saying the Mafia has taken full control of Melindi. Then talking about, um, uh, traditionally, there's a lot of Italian tourism here in Melindi. Criminal networks need to invest in profitable businesses. Many times abroad, they do it in communities that they know where they have friends and shady financial advisors. On Melindi's main drag, just opposite Karen Blixen, one of the Italian-owned restaurants where people meet for an espresso and a gossip, is the concrete shell of a moor. On the top floor, staring down on the empty car park, is a large golden statue of a Buddha and a sign reading Mario's Buddha Fashion Lounge and Restaurant. The owner of the boarded-up club, Mario Mello, was arrested and extradited to Italy in 2017. Known as the king of the discotheques in Sardinia, where he managed some of the island's most exclusive clubs, 
Mele had left Italy for Melindi in 2013, fleeing an international arrest warrant. He spent almost five years hiding in plain sight on the Kenyan coast where he bought several clubs and hosted tasteful events like ladies' wet t-shirt contests and waitress and bikini night. He used to talk about it and boast that no one could touch him here. One Italian man told me he felt like a king. Then this other fellow, Tanzini, is a controversial figure originally from Tuscany. He arrived in Melindi as a hunting guide almost 50 years ago and later opened the White Elephant one of Melindy's most exclusive resorts. He is known as a shrewd businessman, sculptor, poet, philosopher, architect, a womanizer, and an eccentric. He happily cultivates the image by telling endless stories about his contact with other dimensions, the six or seven attempts on his life by secret services, his many lovers, and about the time he saw a flying saucer hovering above the Indian Ocean. Tanzini, who on his website says he loves Africa because it is innocent and poor, hit the headlines in 2015 for representing Kenya at the Venice Biennale as part of a panel described as a frightening manifestation of neo-colonialism vulgarly presented as multi multiculturalism and primitivism at its very worst. When I visited him in his villa, he told me that he's inspired by the tribal artworks of the Giriyama tribe, the lady who looked after me was a Giriyama. Uh, one of the ethnic groups that live on the coast. See this, he asked, pointing to a wooden totem about a meter tall. It's very powerful. No one knows this, but they were built to communicate with other dimensions. He found dozens of them while hunting in the forest decades ago and took them. The totems are sacred to the Giriyama, and removing them goes against all their spiritual beliefs. The Giriyama stopped erecting the totems long ago fearing they would be stolen. And finally, Transcentury has pledged 30.9% stake in its subsidiary East African cables as security for a 366.5 million shilling loan it took from its controlling shareholder, Kurama Capital. Kenya's top prosecutors ordered nine people charged over the deadly Rose Farm disaster. Uh, it seems to be moving things along. Once again, thank you for stopping by.